Welcome to our exploration of topic 2.1 in environmental systems and societies. Today we're going to examine the fundamental building blocks of ecosystems from individual organisms to the entire biosphere. Let's get into it. Let's start by understanding the biosphere, the largest ecological system on our planet. The biosphere encompasses all parts of our planet where life exists, from the deepest trenches in the oceans to the tops of the highest mountains and everything in between. The biosphere is composed of many interconnected systems, each one of which plays a vital role in maintaining Earth's ecological balance. This hierarchical organization helps us understand how different components interact and how they influence one another. At the most basic level, we have individual organisms. According to the biological species concept, a species comprises organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. To illustrate this concept, let's look at some examples. Different dog breeds, despite having really varied appearances, they all belong to the same species because regardless of their breed, they can interbreed and produce puppies that can also interbreed and produce offspring. That's why we say that their offspring are fertile. However, when we look at crosses between different species like horses and donkeys, or between lions and tigers, while those species can mate, their offspring, mules and ligers respectively, are sterile. That means their offspring cannot reproduce to make more copies of the offspring. This reproductive barrier is what defines horses and donkeys and tigers and lions as separate species. To manage the immense diversity of life on Earth, scientists use classification systems. This systematic organization allows for the efficient identification and prediction of characteristics among different organisms. Taxonomists are scientists who work specifically on the classification of life on Earth. Taxonomists use different tools to identify organisms. Classification is really important to help us understand the degree of biodiversity and relationships among organisms within ecosystems. One primary tool is the dichotomous key, and that uses a series of paired choices, yes or no questions, to identify organisms based on observable characteristics. Each choice leads to another pair of options, and you keep doing this and breaking down larger groups of organisms into smaller and smaller groups until you have a, an organism that meets all the criteria of all the different questions that you've gone through. Another important method involves comparing specimens to established collections. Some collections are in museums, but other collections are in field guides. Right? So those field guides might be a book or it might be a digital app. And they are really valuable reference tools for species identification, especially because you can carry them with you out into the field and do species identification on the fly. Modern taxonomy also utilizes DNA surveys where genetic material is analyzed to identify species. This process involves collection, extraction, amplification, sequencing, analysis, and interpretation of DNA samples. It's pretty cool because we can simply collect a sample of soil or of water, and then we extract from that tiny little microscopic bits of DNA, and we compare the genome sequences in that tiny sample that we've got. After we've amplified it, we've multiplied it, and we compare that to libraries of DNA samples around the world, and we can figure out which species are there because they're leaving their DNA behind in the environment. Moving up from individual organisms, we encounter populations. A population is a group of organisms of the same species living in the same place at the same time in which are capable of interbreeding. Consider African elephants as an example. While they're the same species, different populations exist in various locations across their range, which are separated by geographical barriers or human development. Take this map of Tanzania, for example. In the top part of this map, we have elephants in the Ngoro Serengeti area, and in the bottom part of the map, in this reddish oranges areas, we see elephant populations in the Rawaha area. The elephants in the purple areas in the northern part of Tanzania can interact with one another. They might migrate back and forth between the purple zones, and they can interact and they interbreed. Same thing will happen with the populations or the groups of elephants that are in the different orange zones. They are capable of walking across the landscape and meeting up with one another and interacting with one another to breed and produce fertile offspring. However, 
because of the road network and all of the agricultural areas and places with human populations like cities that separate the purple zones from the orange zones, elephants from the purple areas don't interact with elephants in the orange areas. Therefore, the elephants in the purple zones are considered one population of African elephants, and the elephants in the orange zones are considered a different population of elephants, even though they're all the same species. They're not in the same place at the same time, so they can't interbreed. Similarly, Asian elephant populations face isolation due to habitat fragmentation and the fact that a bunch of them live on that are islands surrounded by the ocean. And while elephants can swim, the distances between islands are generally too great for them to swim across and interact. This leads to genetic challenges because those elephants don't have opportunities to interbreed with one another. The distribution of populations is influenced by both biotic and abiotic factors in the environment. Abiotic factors include physical and chemical conditions such as temperature, light, pH, and soil characteristics while biotic factors involve interactions with other organisms. Temperature is an important abiotic factor affecting species distribution, and this can be demonstrated by the sea surface temperature patterns globally. We find some species in the warm areas and different species in cool areas. Light intensity also plays an important role in ecosystems, particularly in aquatic ecosystems where light levels decrease the deeper you go in water, the less light there is, and that limits photosynthesis and the overall productivity of the system. In terrestrial ecosystems, such as a forest, the forest structure influences light penetration, and light penetration affects temperature and evaporation rates beneath the forest canopy. So in an area where there is less canopy, like a place that's just been cut recently and the trees haven't had the opportunity to grow and mature into, into their full size, you'll find very different abiotic factors in that forest than you will in a mature forest where the tree canopy has all grown together and closed it off and it makes that ground level nice and shadowy and cool and dark. pH levels, particularly in aquatic environments, will also significantly impact species distribution and survival. Some species thrive in more acidic environments and other species prefer more alkaline environments. This is also true of plants because you'll find that in acidic soils, you'll have one plant population and in more basic or alkaline soils, you'll have a very, very different collection of plant species that are growing. Ocean acidification, which is shown here by pH level, is becoming an increasingly important factor in marine ecosystems as climate change leads to increasing acidification and decreasing pH levels. Salinity patterns influence ocean currents, and that in turn affects the distribution of different marine species around the world. Dissolved oxygen levels are another important abiotic factor for the distribution of aquatic organisms because different species have different tolerance ranges of the amount of dissolved oxygen in water. Soil texture, which is determined by the ratio of sand, silt, and clay particles in a soil, affects water retention, it affects nutrient availability for plants, it affects how quickly the soil evaporates or how quickly it drains, and all of those things affect the plants that grow there. All these factors contribute to defining a species' ecological niche the specific set of conditions and resources that it requires for survival and reproduction. Consider the African savanna, where a bunch of different herbivores occupy distinct niches despite sharing the same habitat. Zebras, wildebeest, and gazelles all feed on different parts of the grasses or on different stages of the grass growth, and therefore they occupy different niches. First, the zebras come in and they eat the top parts of the grasses, the tall grasses, leaving just the short grasses behind. That's the stuff that the wildebeest love. And so the wildebeest follow the zebras. They come in after the zebras are there. So they occupy a different niche in time. The wildebeest eat those grass remnants all the way down essentially to the roots. But the roots have energy left over. It has stored carbohydrates in them. And so the roots are able to sprout new grasses. And the gazelles are the ones who love all those new grass sprouts. So after the wildebeest have grazed everything down to essentially bare ground and the grasses have had a chance to re-sprout, then the gazelles come in after the zebras and the wildebeest have moved on. So 
the same area can support three different species of herbivores because they all occupy different ecological niches. There are a bunch of different population interactions that you need to know in ESS. And in particular, you need to know herbivory, predation, parasitism, mutualism, disease, and competition. So we're going to quickly go through each of those individually. Herbivory is exemplified by caterpillars feeding on plants. It's basically hunting plants. And herbivory can significantly impact primary productivity. The more herbivores there are, the more herbivory there is, the lower the plant populations go. Predation, or hunting, is when one consumer organism eats another consumer organism. In the example you see here on the slide, ladybugs are consuming aphids. Both of those organisms are consumers. And when ladybugs eat aphids, they help regulate the population of the aphids. And that actually benefits the plants because the aphids are eating the plants or they're feeding on the plant sap. Parasites are organisms that live in or on another organism and harm the host. Mistletoe, despite its association with the Christmas holidays, is a tree parasite. And mistletoe can affect the resource distribution, particularly water and nutrients in the parts of the tree. So where the mistletoe grows, it blocks the distribution of water to the branches beyond, and it takes the water that the tree intended to send out to its leaves and its branches for itself. Mutualism and symbiosis are where both organisms in a relationship equally benefit. So a really nice example of symbiosis or mutualisms are clownfish and sea anemones because the clownfish are protected by the stinging sea anemones and the anemones then have additional cleaning and they get nutrients from the feces from the clownfish. They have this really nice co-evolutionary relationship where the clownfish protect the anemones from potential predators. They provide additional nutrients for the anemones to grow. And likewise, the anemones protect the clownfish from clownfish predators. Both species equally benefit. Diseases can dramatically alter ecosystem composition and structure. Here on the background of this slide, you can see these gigantic trees. This is the American chestnut. At one point, it was the most dominant tree in Eastern North America. It's a fantastic wood. It was used for building all kinds of things, homes, furniture. And then in the early 20th century, a fungus appeared. It was first identified in the Bronx, I think, in New York. Uh, it was brought in from Asia by accident on some boats with timber on it. And that fungus has attacked chestnut trees. And so what has happened then is in something like 4 billion chestnut trees vanished. They all died off as a result of chestnut blight in the first 50 years that we knew it was around. All of these interactions influence the carrying capacity of an area. The carrying capacity is the maximum sustainable population size that a particular environment or ecosystem can sustain indefinitely. Various factors limit population size, including both biotic and abiotic components. Look at the components that are here on the right side of this slide and identify which ones you think are biotic and which ones you think are abiotic. Population regulation occurs through density dependent factors and negative feedback mechanisms. We've already seen this back in topic one when we looked at predator-prey relationships. Some factors are density independent. That means they are not related to the density of the population. Natural disasters are a classic example of density independent factors. Volcanic eruptions affect populations regardless of the size or the density of the organisms that live there. Everything in the path of that lava flow is at equal risk of dying. Competition for food intensifies as population density increases. This is exemplified by deer populations. As the deer population increases, they're all out trying to eat the same kind of plants. And so those plants have a harder time reproducing and growing, which means there's less food available for the deer. And the deer population then gets stressed out. You have greater mortality and less successful reproduction. It's exactly the same relationship as we've seen with the classic wolf and moose or lynx and hare predator-prey relationships. Disease transmission becomes easier with dense populations because the pathogens don't have to travel as far to infect new individuals. So transmission becomes a lot easier in very dense areas. As we've already mentioned, predation pressure often increases with the density of the prey population. So the more little critters there are for bigger critters to eat, then the greater the population, the bigger critters. Whatever it is that these sharks are going to feed on, 
As their population increases, the shark population will increase. But then as the population of the prey, the pop as the population of the shark prey decreases, the shark populations will also decrease. That's how the predator-prey relationship regulates population density. As you see in these pictures of the Atlantic puffins in Scotland, competition for breeding territories can intensify in crowded conditions. There's only so much space where you can make a nest and lay eggs. As the population density increases, there's greater competition for those nesting sites. And when it becomes too stressful, there's more fighting, more of those nesting sites get destroyed, some of the eggs may, may get destroyed, and that has a negative impact on population size. Finally, competition for mates becomes pretty intense as population density increases. Males will fight over access to females, and those fights can result in injuries, they can result in death, and those affect population sizes. So when we understand the relationships between these biotic factors and the abiotic factors in ecosystems, and how those factors influence populations, as well as understanding density-dependent and density-independent factors, we can better comprehend how ecosystems function and how human activities can impact those ecosystems. I'll be back soon with another video for the rest of Topic 2.1. In the meanwhile, happy learning.